I'm Ellie Kohanim with JBS. So thrilled and honored to have with us today Senator Ben Cardin of Maryland. Um, Senator Cardin, it's, it's really just, again, an honor and a thrill for us to have you with us at JBS. Um, let's just jump right into it. On everybody's minds today is um, what is happening with the Iran nuclear deal? We're kind of like tick-tocking to May 12. What are your thoughts on that? First, it's good to be with you. Uh, the Iran nuclear agreement dealt with Iran's nuclear weapon development. I opposed the agreement when it was being negotiated. After it was signed, it became law. I have uh, been a strong believer that we must make sure Iran complies with the agreement, which is a lifetime ban on obtaining a nuclear weapon. Uh, President Trump is determined to either get it changed or to uh, pull out of the agreement. Uh, if he pulls out of the agreement while Iran is still in compliance, it will cause problems internationally. It will be the United States that will be isolated. Are well, you tell, tell us a little bit about that, because, I mean, there's certainly people here today at the Jerusalem Post Conference who believe that the U.S. president should pull out of the JCPOA. Well, by pulling out, we give Iran a pass. We let them be the ones who can go to the international tribunals and say that the United States is the violator, not Iran. Iran's the bad guy. Uh, we need to concentrate on what Iran is doing and its support of terrorism in, in their region around the world, what they're doing in violation of human rights, the ballistic missile violations, the arms violations. We need to get Europe working with us to take action against Iran on these non-nuclear violations. And then we need to enforce the nuclear agreement to make sure Iran never becomes a nuclear weapon state. With the United States pulling out of the agreement while Iran is in compliance, it just isolates our international support against Iran. I think the question is, is Iran actually in compliance? I mean, they haven't been a, an honest actor uh, historically, correct? And um, I think there was a lot of measures in the JCPOA where Iran was supposedly checking on themselves, which, you know, I mean, I can't imagine anybody who would agree to any agreement where the person is checking on themselves and saying, yes, you know, we've done everything right and we're not developing any nuclear capacity over here. So, and, and I know you were opposed to the agreement in the first place, but Senator, what do we do to make sure that Iran is actually being an honest actor? You know, I think that's a very valid question. We don't trust Iran. Look what they're doing in Syria. Look what they're doing in Yemen. Look what they're doing in Iraq. You just go through the countries that they're in Lebanon. What they're doing in all these countries. No, we don't trust uh, Iran whatsoever. But they are in compliance with the nuclear agreement. That's not one senator saying that. That's what the international inspectors are saying. And that's what our own country experts are saying. Uh, those that are in their national security team with the president will, will acknowledge that Iran is in compliance with the nuclear agreement. Their main concern is what happens when we reach those target dates when they can now increase their capacity to enrich. I'm concerned about that. We're not at that stage yet. So for the United States to pull out of the agreement, reimpose sanctions against Iran, it would be the United States violating the agreement, not Iran. I hear you on that in the international tribunal. I guess the question, I should tell you, Senator, I was born in Iran myself, so this is a very mm -hmm. um, passionate topic for me and for many Iranian expats. I think the question is, could we see regime change in Iran if we did enforce sanctions or renewed sanctions? Is that a possibility? And I would say there are millions of people in the country that are hoping for that. Well, and again, let me just underscore a point. Our, our complaint is not with the Iranian people, it's with their leaders. Absolutely. And, and we, we should, and same thing when we talk about what Russia is doing, it's about Mr. Putin and his leadership in Russia, not the Russian people. So you're exactly right. Regime change is a tricky business. The United States is not in the business of having policies for regime change. So that's something that we really need to enforce the right of the people for their own self-determination. Yes, we'll speak out against violations of human rights, and the Iranian people's rights have been violated by their current government, and we'll speak out about that. But it's up to the Iranian people to select their own leaders. You know what, I'd love to shift a little bit from Iran to Syria, which as we were discussing earlier, is very much connected. What are your thoughts on what Iran is doing in Syria and what Putin is doing in Syria for that matter? Well, you know, clearly what, it's, it's mostly Russia. Russia is facilitating the Assad regime. Uh, they're allowing it to continue to be able to uh, carry out these atrocities, including the use of chemical warfare, which is outrageous. 
but the, their, their surrogate on the field, their, their proxy on the field, is, are the Iranians. Uh, so the Iranian military is very much helping uh, President Assad in his military campaign. In exchange for that, the Iranians are getting closer and closer to Israel. And that's a major concern to the security of Israel. Absolutely. And I think many people, again, who are here today for the Jerusalem Post conference are very much have their eyes on that northern border of Israel and wondering what's next. So for the first time, we saw the Iranians actually um, infiltrating the border of Israel. We saw Israeli retaliation. And so, you know, all of us are wondering what is next? What, you know, Senator, what do you think from an American perspective? What would you like to see happening in that region? Well, that's why we need to be engaged in Syria, not from a military point of view, but for how that issue is resolved. And, and clearly, there's two campaigns. The, the, the campaign against ISIS, I think, is understood. We all are against ISIS. The civil war in Syria is more complicated. And here, Russia has taken a side in, in, in regards to the Assad regime. And the United States needs to make it clear that we're not going to allow, allow Syria through Russia to give Iran a border on Israel. That's unacceptable, and we have, to, we have to speak out about that. Senator, thank you so much for saying that, because I think, again, our audience, the, the people here at the Jerusalem Post, they very much want to hear that the U.S. has Israel's back, specifically on this issue. I think we're going to hear a lot of Israeli speakers today tell us that they are terribly concerned about Iran in the short range in Syria, in the long range, the nuclear capacity. And so I think the Israelis are waiting for the U.S. to say, yes, we are allies, we do have your back, and we're going to make sure that Syria does not become the next frontier of, of Iran. What do you think the U.S. can do to actually make sure that that doesn't happen? Well, the United States has to stand up to Russia and not allow Russia to dictate how this Syrian civil war is ended. Uh, that we, we, again, we're not in regime change, although Assad has uh, lost all legitimacy to be a leader. He cannot stay in, in, as their leader. He should be at the Hague uh, for war crimes. But as Syria determines its future, it's got to be clear that its territory needs to have integrity, and you cannot allow the Iranians to have a foothold in Syria on the Israeli border. Again, I think our audience is thrilled to hear you, Senator Cardin, say that. And um, I'm just wondering if you have any last words for us. We have Jewish and non-Jewish audience all across the United States and actually internationally who watch us on our website. So I was just wondering if there's anything, the Senator, you would like to share with our audience. Last final thoughts. Certainly, 70 years. What a remarkable relationship, that special relationship that President Truman started in 1948, 70 years that it's helped Israel, it's helped the United States. We have shared values, and the relationship's important to Israel's security and the United States' security. Let's make sure we keep it strong. Let's do that. Senator Cardin, again, it's our honor and a pleasure to have you on JBS. And please come back again. Come to our studios. We'd love to have you. Thank you. Thank you. At the 2018 Jerusalem Post Conference, what a treat I have. Um, it's been said that the most pro-Israel senator in the United States Senate, Senate is Lindsey Graham, and he joins us now. You knocked it out of the park down there. They well, went nuts for you. Well, you had a standing ovation. Well, that's very nice, but the reason I'm so supportive of Israel is, one, I'm a Baptist raised from a very young boy to believe that God blesses those who bless Israel, but it's much deeper than that. It's the only democracy in the region. The same people who want to destroy Israel want to destroy us. You have a Supreme Court in Israel where you have an Arab uh, a member of the court. It's the one place in the Mideast where a mother can raise their child, an Arab mother can raise their child, and they have uh, you know rule of law and you can elect your own leaders. These are things worth fighting for, and the people who want to destroy Israel want to destroy us. So as Israel goes, so goes us. Okay. You were instrumental in passing the Taylor Force Act. Yeah. So. What's happened here is it's sort of the dirty little secret of the Palestinians have been exposed. They say one thing in English, another thing in Arabic. They actually have laws on the books that if a young person is uh, put in jail in Israel for being a terrorist, they will pay that person as if they were in the Palestinian uh, security forces. They will give that person's family lifetime benefits. And if they die as a martyr, the family gets a lump sum payment. Taylor Force was a West Point graduate. His family lives in my state, South Carolina. He wasn't Jewish. He got stabbed going to dinner as a graduate student in Israel. And they welcomed the guy who killed him as a hero. So we cut their money off until they changed their behavior. Okay. Senator Graham, why is it that not everybody 
in the United States Senate and the House doesn't understand that the reason there is no peace between Israel and the Palestinians is that there is an intransigence in the Palestinian world yeah. because the Palestinians believe that land is theirs yeah. and they don't want to share it. Well, here's all I can, I can say this. The media narrative about Israel is that they're the bully and the Palestinian are victims. Correct. When you look at polling in the United States, most people are sympathetic to the Palestinian uh, people more than Israel. Here's what I say. A two-state solution makes sense to me only if Israel can be secure. The dignity that comes with self-rule is possible for the Palestinians only when they unite under a single banner rejecting terrorism. How do you negotiate with a divided community? Hamas controls Gaza. They want to drive Israel into the sea. Every time Israel leaves a place like Gaza or Lebanon, they get rockets. So there will never be a peace deal until the Palestinians reconcile themselves around the idea of coexistence in peace. Okay, there are 100 senators. How many of them understand what you just said? I think a lot of them understand the, the dilemma, but the left yes. is getting more and more anti-Israeli. Why? I don't know. All I can say is- You have is, an instinct. Well, the media narrative throughout the Western world is that Israel's the problem, not the surrounding yes. neighborhood. 20 resolutions condemning the state of Israel in the UN Security Council, six against the world at large. There's a anti-Semitism percolating throughout the world that's disturbing. The mm -hmm. truth is Israel's not perfect, but they're under siege. Everywhere you turn, every border is collapsing. So now's the time to be a better friend to Israel, less of a critic. The IDF is a very professional military. They try not to kill civilians. Hezbollah and Hamas puts their civilians at risk on purpose. That's a fundamental difference. Okay. When you ran, when you were thinking of running for president, mm -hmm. you were critical of Donald Trump. Right. Donald Trump becomes president. You're not that happy. I want to know, as you've seen what he's done, especially as it relates to Israel, yeah. and you ticked it off yourself today. Yeah. He moved the, the embassy. Yeah. He has. So let me give you my view of Donald give, Trump. I think he's been a very good friend of Israel. He beat me like a drum. I respect the fact that he won. I will oppose him when I think I have to, but I want him to be successful. He's putting conservative judges on the court as a Republican. I like that. Our economy is growing. He cut taxes. He's taking the gloves off when it comes to ISIS. He's got Rocket Man at the table because Rocket Man's afraid of him. He's going to withdraw from the Iranian deal unless we get a better one. He moved the embassy to Jerusalem. We have a hole in our strategy when it comes to Syria. But the election's over. He is my president. I want him to succeed, and i got to go. <laughs> it's been a pleasure. One day you'll give me some real time. Thank you very much. Thank you. We are thrilled and honored to have with us former Israeli Prime Minister Ehud Olmert. Prime Minister Olmert, it's really an honor to have you here with I'm us delighted. today. I'm um, delighted. First, let's talk about the theme of the conference today, Israel's 70th celebration birthday. How does it feel to be a part of history in that way? Well, everyone that is, uh, who is a citizen of the State of Israel uh, share these uh, celebrations, share this pride, and uh, I'm sure he's uh, very happy uh, to be part of it. And indeed, there is a lot to be um, uh, proud about and happy about. There is Israel so much is to be great proud country. of. It's a great country. So what are you most proud of of Israel? Well, I'm, I'm most proud of the fact that there are um, close to 9 million people living in the state of Israel. When Israel was created in 1948, there were about 650,000 people living in Israel, wow. Jews living in Israel. Today, there are 7.5 million Jews living in Israel, which makes the Jewish community in Israel the largest in the world, which it was not when Israel was created. Israel is a very strong, successful, I dare say, and it may sound a little bit exaggerated, but it's not. I dare say Israel is the most successful country uh, of the 20th century. That's when we were created. Wow. From nowhere, from nowhere, from the ashes of Auschwitz, if you want, from, from the uh, deportation of Jews from every Muslim country in the North Africa or in Asia, we have created a country which is strong, independent, economically successful, innovative, uh, and uh, really is a, a great place to live in. 
with all the difficulties, with all the problems. I a agree. great place to live in. We think Israel is a modern day miracle. Absolutely. I'm just curious, uh, Prime Minister, what is your message to young Americans who might be watching us in terms of what would they be surprised to find in Israel, something that they couldn't imagine? <laughs> you know, I could say, in a certain, it may sound humoristic, but I, in, in a certain, more subtle way, it may be true. If you guys want America, you better come to Israel. This is the place with unlimited opportunities, with the most, the widest future horizons in terms of success, in terms of innovations, in terms of uh, quality of life. No other place can be like Israel, has the potential of Israel, has the, the enormous talent to make use of all the opportunities that there are and those which are not there but which will be created by us to make Israel even a greater place to be in. So for a young American person, a Jew, obviously, you know, because of the natural affiliation to uh, the Jewish state, uh, I would say come to Israel. There, is, uh, uh, there are great universities, there are great research centers, there are great opportunities, and there is an unlimited space for an individual to uh, invest his talents and to see the fruits of these investments in the growth and development of the state of Israel. Well, we're definitely seeing it in Israel as a startup nation. And I'm just wondering, could you also touch a little bit on the diversity in Israel? You know, there's some accusations about how are Israeli Arabs treated, how are Palestinians treated. When I go visit Israel, I see a, a diverse country like nowhere else in the world. I see Jew, Muslim, Christian walking together down the streets. What do you see when you're in well, Israel? Well, we definitely have to uh, improve uh, the attitude towards the Israeli Arabs. They are Israeli citizens, they have to be, not just uh, to be called, but to actually be equal citizens with full rights in the state of Israel. And it's not the case as of yet. It should change, and it should change rapidly. I tried to do it when I was Prime Minister, but I'm not, and it has to continue. And uh, we have to uh, rapidly address ourselves to the Palestinian issue. Uh, and there is no other solution other than two states for two people, and we will have to, uh, to adjust to the idea that this is the inevitable solution and to take the necessary steps in order to do it. So That's I'm not what concerns me. Yes. It concerns me, yes. of course, very much, but what concerns me also is what, is, uh, what appears to be the growing separation between uh, Jews in Israel and Jews outside of Israel. What so do you while think we could I, do about that? While I think about the young Jew and I say to him, come over and be part of the state of Israel, I must say that we have unfortunately created a feeling amongst many Jews in America that they are not Jews, that uh, we don't recognize uh, their identity because they do not follow precisely the uh, way of life of the Orthodox community, which is a tiny part of the um, Jewish community in Israel and in America. And it's time that we will change this attitude and that we will embrace to ourselves all the Jews and all the de denominations and all the different schools of thought amongst the Jews inside Israel and outside Israel in order to make them really feel that they are part of us. So, Prime Minister, the change that you would like to see is more of an embrace of the different Absolutely. streams of Judaism. More solidarity, more genuine solidarity and tolerance. Tolerance. We have to be more tolerant. Uh, Israel is not perfect. What I said is Israel is great and Israel is great. Israel is not perfect. It can be much better. It should be much better. Part of it is to become more tolerant. Part of it is to address ourselves to the Jews that live outside of Israel, no matter what their affiliation is, whether they are Reform or Conservatives or Orthodox, they are all Jews and they all should share in everything that we have in the state of Israel and all the historical sites which are part of the Jewish heritage which we have 
they belong to all of the Jews, not just to part of the Jews. What a beautiful message from the Prime Minister of Israel. We're really thrilled to have you and your embrace of the broad American Jewish community. I think our audience is thrilled to hear that all Jews are welcome in Israel. I know for a fact that that's true. Hopefully, if they hear it from the Israeli Prime Minister, will, should they take up your invitation to come visit? Anytime. All right. Well, again, it's a thrill and an Thank honor you. to have with us Israeli Prime Thank Minister Ehud Olmert here today with JBS at the Jerusalem Post Conference 2018. Thank you. Thank you. I have the great pleasure right now of sitting with General Yoav Gallant, who addressed the Jerusalem Post Conference and was a you were absolutely brilliant. And there are a lot of wonderful people speaking today. But your message was extraordinary. Thank you, sir. I'm going to ask you one question about what you said, and I want you to elaborate a little bit. You talked about the extent to which you are absolutely confident that Israel will both endure and thrive and deal with any threat that, is, that may come its way. And you talked about two threats in general. One is Iran, and then you talked about attrition. You talked about a subtlety that Israel is dealing with today. Can you explain to me, what is the subtlety that you'd like American Jews to understand? Not the big picture Iran, but the day-to-day -day problem of assault on the state of Israel. The uh, Israeli uh, situation nowadays is much better than it's ever been in many aspects. But we are facing a phenomena that has never been in the region, at least for the last 70 years of the creation of Israel. And this is the Shi storm. Now, Basically, the Iranians used to stay on the eastern side of the big rivers. And uh, all of a sudden, we find them uh, taking over Iraq from Baghdad to Basra, all the south and now the north. They already have position in Lebanon because of Hezbollah. And they are trying to take uh, Syria uh, under Russian wings. That means that they will create an arch that will surround Israel and Jordan. And I won't be surprised that their next challenge will be to destroy Jordan in order to create a very long border with Israel on the eastern side. Now, this is part of the thinking of way of war of attrition mm -hmm. to uh, sabotage and to infiltrate into Israel, to recruit uh, Palestinian Israelis in order to create terror attacks, to support Hamas, to support Hezbollah. Altogether, this is the way they are looking on the situation. And this is all aimed as a secondary effort, not the major effort. This second, uh, secondary effort is giving them time to achieve their ultimate goal, which is to possess nuclear weapons. So by the time they are making us fighting against their agents, they are developing weapons of mass destruction. Therefore, what President Trump decided to change the route, to change the deviation that had occurred during the last few years, and to go back to course, meaning Iran is the problem, not the solution, this is a very brave, very smart, and very courageous decision. And I'm sure that the termination of the United States will bring fruits. Mm. Yoav, were you upset with the Iran nuclear deal? I think, I think it was a very bad deal. And uh, let's put it in a very simple terms. First of all, if the Iranians are working according to the deal, they are allowed to have missiles, they are allowed to have the operators to initiate everything, including a nuclear weapon, they are allowed to enrich uranium to a certain level, and the inspection is not allowed to inspect anything but designated areas that are approved by the Iranians, which is a joke. Now, looking at this situation, what we have done is 
postponing their ability in 10 years, but turn it to be much more magnitude, meaning they will have the capability to have dozens of nuclear bombs within 10 years by the year 2026. This is a danger for the free world and especially for Israel. When you describe it that way, it seems so obvious. There were many, many American Jews who supported the Iran deal. And there are many people who feel, feel that it was the best deal possible. What would you say to them? Uh, most of the people are not in the details. Most of the people are having a trust in their leaders. Most of the people believe that the future will be better. That was, was driven millions of Jews to stay in Poland and in Russia instead of going to the East when the Second World War happened. People have optimistic approach, but we need to look at the future in a very clear uh, eyes and to understand that if someone is threatened you and saying, I am going to destroy you, I am going to vanish the state of Israel, take him seriously. Mm -hmm. We don't have an experimental second state, only one state, and this is the dream of the Jewish generation for 2,000 years. Therefore, if the deal, after analyze it, is so clearly uh, defected for many reasons, the good solution was to uh, keep on with the sanctions and bring Iran to the floor to a situation that eventually they will give up, as it's happening nowadays, hopefully with North Korea. Mm -hmm. But at the moment, that's not happening. You as an Israeli, by the way, I, didn't, I don't think you spoke. You have family in Israel? I have family in Israel. My, my mom is a, a, is a Holocaust survivor who immigrated on board of the famous ship Exodus. Really? Seriously. Uh, my, my father, who died many years ago, was a, a partisan uh, boy and then a volunteer to fight in the independence war and later on, on the big wars. And of course, uh, my wife, my kids, all living in uh, Israel. Uh, I devote my life to the security of Israel, to defend Israel, and I'm willing to do anything necessary in order to defend Israel. And I'm sure that we will overcome those obstacles. Okay. You know, I've, two things frighten me, and I don't live in Israel, but they frighten me. On the one hand, I'm told that in Lebanon, there are 100,000 missiles pointed at Israel. And you've just said to me, you're concerned of, that Iran could potentially get a strong nuclear arsenal unless things change. I say to myself, at some point, something could go wrong and Lebanon could fire who knows how many missiles at Israel? Unless I don't understand something, it sounds to me like there's no way in the world Israel could stop that kind of assault on the state of Israel. And if Iran does get a nuclear weapon and you're seriously concerned, you worry in real life that they would want to destroy the state of Israel. I don't know how they would do that without destroying the entire region. But if you worry that they would use any kind of nuclear weapon against Israel. Those two threats seem to be overwhelming. And I know you've had a very impressive career as an active general in the IDF. And you were responsible for Kessled, is that correct? That's correct. In Gaza. But I wanna know from your professional experience, how do you sleep at night? How do you not worry for your wife and your children and for your mother? given these two realities. These are not games, these are realities. Well, one at a time. The issue of Hezbollah in Lebanon is a serious one, but uh, let me put it this way. If a war will happen with uh, Hezbollah in Lebanon, we will pay price, but we will bring Lebanon 
and Hezbollah back to the Stone Age. No water, no bridges, nothing. They will pray for God that something will help them. No way that Israeli kids will be killed in Israeli cities and we will not make them pay a very expensive price. Therefore, I hope that they will have enough common sense not to open a, a war with I Israel, understand. but things can happen. Uh, and as I said, what we have seen in 2006 is only appetizer to what we are willing to do if someone is going to attack us from Lebanon. Discussing the Iranian issue, this is a much bigger and a, a major event. Therefore, we are dealing with it during the last generation, at least 20 years. And uh, uh, we are hoping that uh, the effort led by President Trump to block the Iranians from having nuclear weapons will be fruitful. Mm -hmm. uh, I was military secretary to Prime Minister Sharon as we sat in the Oval Office and uh, I uh, introduced in the name of the Prime Minister all the, what used to be the Iranian uh, plan to enrich uranium and to uh, uh, getting fissile material and, uh, and uh, uh, a bomb that will be able to, to, uh, to turn to be a massive, massive, very massive uh, weapon. And uh, the president at the time, it was 15 years ago, said that we will not allow Iran to have nuclear weapon. I'm sure that this reflect also what President Trump is repeating and saying and leading. Uh, the United States have to make sure, as it happened nowadays too late in North Korea, as it happened in other places, that the Iranians won't have the option to, uh, uh, to possess nuclear weapon. But in any event, Israel is strong enough and we will be able to protect ourselves by ourselves if necessary. Even against Iran? Even against Iran if necessary. Okay. You do sleep well at night? I sleep well because I'm an old soldier and <laughs> if you have even one minute you need to sleep. Okay. One more area. Again, you were the head of uh, cast lead, Operation Cast Lead in Gaza. And then we had Operation Protective Edge. And as you and I are sitting right now, there is going on along the B Gaza border all this fomenting and the uh, Palestinians in Gaza, incited by Hamas, are suggesting they're going to maybe breach the fence, the barrier fence between, fence between Israel and Gaza. And the world looks on and sort of says, what's wrong with Israel? Why are you shooting live ammunition and killing Palestinians who are doing nothing more than burning tires and throwing rocks? I want to hear what your perspective is on this entire issue of the fomenting of uh, incitement in Gaza. And if you were if you were still the general in charge, would you do anything different? How do you assess how the IDF is handling it and how it's being described in world opinion? Well, uh, uh, first of all, let us remember what happening in Gaza. We disengaged from Gaza Strip 12 years ago. Uh, we left houses, greenhouses, uh, everything over there. And uh, they had 12 years in order to, uh, to, uh, build, uh, to build and to uh, flourish their uh, fields, their uh, houses, their industry. Nothing happened. Any uh, milligram of uh, concrete or cement or uh, iron that is moving in order to help them to build houses is used to build tunnels and rockets. So this is the strategic uh, way that Hamas is leading the population that basically was taken hostage by Hamas in order uh, to use them against Israel. Now, we block Hamas uh, from uh, uh, most of its military abilities. It's very difficult to uh, infiltrate into Israel on the surface. In the tunnels, we are doing a very good job lately. Uh, Iron Dome is blocking the rockets 
the sea is closed, so the situation, the operational situation is not good. So they are using cynically uh, Palestinian civilians in order to spell uh, Palestinian blood and provoke the Israeli soldiers and attract international attention. This is a very bad way to lead people. This is the wrong way to lead people. The cabinet, which I am one of its members, ordered the IDF to stop the Palestinians so they cannot close the border, they cannot damage the defense, and they were ordered to do so with uh, uh, the less possible force that is needed in order to avoid Palestinian wounded and especially casualties. So they are doing their best. I know the commanders, I know the troops. They are doing a very good job. And uh, this, is a, this is a sign of frustration of the, of the Hamas. And every American, every, everyone in the world should ask himself, billions were promised and some of it arrived into Gaza. Where is this money? It's either in tunnels or rockets or in the pockets of the leaders. So behave yourself. And if you want to give us advisors, we have had enough. I told you, my parents are Holocaust survivors. The situation that Jewish blood will be spelled with no retreat is over 70 years ago. No more. If you want to hurt us, we will double the price. If you want to give us flowers, we will send you candies. As simple as that. Kola Kavot, that's wonderful. Well, I, I told you when you came up here, I thought you were fabulous downstairs. And one of the things you said, and I want you to end with this, you were, in, you were not shy in saying that you were disappointed in Israeli society because there's so much division. And you said there's division between left and right, serious division, division between orthodox and secular, and between rich and poor. And I'm listening to this and I'm saying to myself, both as an Israeli, as a Jew, as an American Jew, whatever, all of us, there's something so disappointing about that description of Israeli society. We see some of it here in America as well. But as somebody who has cared your entire career, what's your advice now for the Israeli people in terms of the divisions you've described? And is there any way for American Jewry to help? And you heard just before you, Ron Lauder, talk about the division between the diaspora and Israel. So it's all about division, Yoav. What would you say to us of a positive nature? I, I say that in the opposite way that uh, you are working against your enemies, you should work with your people. Meaning, don't force anyone because it won't help. If you want to get to a better situation, you have to bridge over the opinions. Ultra-Orthodox and secular, poor and rich, uh, people from the uh, center and for the, the peripheral uh, areas, all of them will stay in Israel for the next generation. You have to understand that. Therefore, uh, we need unification because the, the threat from abroad is much bigger than anything we can imagine. And we all know, as I said uh, before, that uh, the Second Temple was destroyed because of baseless hatred. If you want to be strong, to be firm, you have to walk in one fist. Therefore, I'm putting much attention and a lot of efforts in my job to build for, for ultra-Orthodox Jews in all the cities and uh, all over all the areas to help the poor population to close the gaps. Because as I told you, uh, the commander in the front is responsible for the direction. But the pace is dictated by the last man in line. So if you go fast and at the end of the camp, you have someone who is backward, this is a problem. So we have to close gaps, to work together, and to remember that we are one nation and one people. 
you have gone on. Kol Tuv Hatzlacha. You have said me not well. Thank you very much. It is a, I, we have not met before. This was wonderful. I hope I get to meet you many times. I want to pick your brains and learn from you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. All very the much. best. Thank you. you. What a real pleasure I have right now sitting with one of the individuals who has helped make modern American Jewish life possible and Jewish life really around the world possible. Charles Bronfman, it's lovely to sit with you and I appreciate the few moments. You were honored today by the Jerusalem Post for the fact that you were one of those who helped found, create what may be, what may well be the single most dynamic, constructive program ever devised in modern Jewish life. In Hebrew it's called Taglit, we call it Birthright Israel. Um, first of all, Mazal Tov. Thank you so much. Um, do you remember, it was you, uh, Michael Steinhardt, others came involved, uh, Avram Infeld was involved, uh, Yossi Bellin was involved. When the idea first was presented to you, Charles, did you like the idea right away or were you at all skeptical? Well, Yossi was the first one who spoke to me. And I asked him, he wanted to give uh, all 17 years old, 17 year olds uh, a voucher for a trip to Israel. And I remember saying, well, Yossi, it's a very nice idea, but where are you going to get the money? So he made a suggestion about the money, which I will not say on the air. Uh, and I said, well, that may or may not be true, but it isn't going to happen, so you won't get that money. And uh, so that was the end of that. And then Michael, one night, Steinhardt, uh, at a Jerusalem uh, or a, an Israel a museum event, uh, just a few days later, collared me and said, we have to talk. And he, and Balin had spoken to him too. And he said, well, what do you think? And I said, well, it's a scheme to bankrupt the Jewish world. And he said, yeah, but, and I said, well, look, it's audacious. He loved the word. Michael's never forgotten the word, word audacious. That was the beginning of our negotiation, mm -hmm. Michael's and mine. Mm -hmm. And uh, we and our CEOs, Jeff Solomon on my side, and Rabbi Yitz Greenberg on Michael's side, we sat for a year discussing how we were gonna do this and what would be done, et cetera. And then we got very fortunate in Shimshon Shoshani who had twice at that time been the uh, direct, director general of the uh, education department in Israel. He joined us as the CEO and he was fantastic. And uh, I remember June of 1999, we were in my office in Jerusalem with our colleagues and Shimshon said, well, gentlemen, what's it gonna be? And I said, what's what gonna be? He said, well, you have to make a decision. So Michael and I looked at each other, when do we have to decide? He said, today, does the project go forward or not? And our colleagues are all screaming at us, don't do it, don't do it, you don't have the money, nobody's come on board, blah, 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 blah. And one of us, I forget which one, said, yeah, but we promised. And that was it. We then went to a meeting with Shimshon and there was something called a budget. Now, Michael thought that I was surrounded by accountants and lawyers and they would have looked all the stuff over and approved the budget. I said, well, Michael Steinhardt's the king of hedge funds. He's a financial guy, always been financial. He must understand the budget. <laughs> we opened the book and I'll never forget, Michael went absolutely shock white and he looked at me and he said, Charles, there's no one I'd rather go broke with than you. <laughs> and I said, same here, Michael, and the rest is history. You know, that's a wonderful story, Charles, and it's so <laughs> real. Um, people, of course, joined you along the way. They certainly did. And the reality is, as you look back, it has been an, an extraordinarily successful program, wouldn't you say? It's been totally so far beyond our wildest yes. dreams that we could never, never have envisaged the huge success. And that's owed to not only our, our investors uh, in the project, but it's owed to the people on the ground, the uh, trip uh, organizers, the uh, executives of Taglit Birthright Israel, 
the fundraisers, uh, the government of Israel, yes. uh, the Adelsons. I mean, heck, it, it, our budget's now $130 million a year. <laughs> Hopefully, we'll soon be 150. Now, that's a crazy amount of money. It's to crazy, raise. Charles. It's totally insane, but it's happening. And God bless everybody for having Absolutely. made it happen. Well, God bless you for it. You and Michael really had enormous courage. And, you know, people harp. That it, no matter what one does, somebody's around as a critic. But the bottom line is you have tens of thousands of kids now who have a feeling for Israel that wouldn't have that feeling. So call a kavod to you. And well, they also had, have another feeling. You know, perhaps part of our success was that our expectations were very simple. Mm -hmm. We had hoped, without any pressure on anybody, that when the young adults would be finished with their visit to Israel, that they would be proud that they were Jewish, identify with the Jewish people, and have a positive emotional reaction to Israel. That was it. No ifs, ands, or buts. No, you gotta pay me later, no one this. And that worked. And perhaps it worked because it was simple. By the way, it's interesting. You had a very limited, specific goal, and it yes. wasn't that you were there to create Talmud scholars, no. Orthodox Jews. You simply wanted to give young people a sense of connection to Israel and a their Jewishness, yes? Absolutely. And it was so that our communities at home throughout the diaspora would have the next generation infused with the wonders of Judaism whether they were lay or religious, we didn't give a damn. Okay. How, you, how you defined being Jewish was to us totally unimportant. Exactly. As long as the human being said, I'm Jewish and I love it, that you, was it. You won, okay. Right. So that brings me to some of the other things that are being said today at the Jerusalem Post Conference. There is a concern, and it was expressed at the beginning of the conference by Ron Lauder. You know him well, head of the yeah. World Jewish Congress. He's worried about the next generation, Charles. He's worried when he looks on college campuses and sees a disconnect that young people seem now to feel that the Palestinian is the underdog, Israel is the, you know. Overdog. Overdog, exactly. Beating up on the poor Palestinian. Yeah. The, There's no the historical perspective. Story. I'm sorry? It's the David and Goliath story. Yes. We, Except, had been, we had been David, 1948 were David, 1956 we're David. 1967, we're David. 1973, we're David. 1980, we started to become Goliath. Now we're Goliath big time. And some young people who are idealistic, and excuse me for saying it so bluntly, ignorant. If you're idealistic and ignorant and you're Jewish, the next thing you might, you might be influenced to think is, Israel is the cause of the problem. And therefore what you heard Ron Lauder say and others at this conference is, what must be done to try to give young people a more positive sense, what you're really trying to do, what you have been doing through birthright, but outside of birthright, what do Jews do to help the next generation have the kind of commitment that your parents did and you did? And Charles, I don't know if you can go back in time. I don't know now whether it's possible to recreate the ethic and the spirit and the experience. I will say one more thing to you, then I want to hear your answer. I was with you for the 10th anniversary of Birthright at the, in Washington, D.C., at the Israeli Embassy in Washington. Okay. And Michael Oren spoke. And Michael said when he was growing up, he was influenced by anti-Semitism, by the Six-Day War, and by the move to free Soviet Jewry. All of those three, Inf impacted him and his Jewish identity. And even though he was a kid who had to read his Haftarah with transliterated Hebrew, he fell in love with Israel, speaks fluent Hebrew now, has served as Israel's ambassador to the United States, but he talked about how it came from within him. And the question is, there is no more anti-Semitism. There is no more Six-Day War where we are the David, not the Goliath. And there's no major Jewish community yet to save any longer. The experiences that Michael had, which propelled him into Jewish identity, 
are no longer there. And you can't replicate the past. So right. Charles Bronfman, I'm asking you, from your vantage point, in addition to Tagli, Birthright Israel, is there anything you wished American Jewry could do in a concerted, organized fashion that might have a positive impact on this specific problem, the self-identity of young Jews, college age, who see Israel as the Goliath, not the David? Well, that's uh, quite a question, and the preamble is quite a preamble, all of which is true. I think it's not what American Jewry can do. I think it's what Israel can do, and what the conditions in the Middle East will be, because no matter how you, you phrase it, there are perceptions and perception is reality. I remember one day my dear friend Martin Indyk, uh, who was, as you know, ambassador to Israel and he worked for Kerry in the aborted uh, and unsuccessful peace moves. But Martin said to me, you know, they were talking about Hasbara and so on. He said, you take a picture of an Israeli tank confronting a Palestinian boy. Game over. Game over. The Gaza, the last Gaza war, which we all know went on much too long, but nonetheless, it was what it was. You never saw on television a Palestinian having, holding a gun. All you saw was elderly people digging through rubble or ladies holding little babies who were obviously crying. And on the other side, you only saw Israeli tanks, you saw Israeli soldiers with guns, and you saw bombs falling from aircraft on Gaza. We understood, or we understand today, that that was the condition that Hamas gave in order for uh, reporters to report on the war from their side. Now, th this is hard. So it's nothing that American Jewry, frankly, can do about that. How are you gonna deny the television pictures? You can't. To me, the savior of Israel and the savior of American Jewry will be the day that there is a deal between Israel and the Palestinians, that there will be two states, that the moderate Arab countries will take what's going on under the table and put it on the top of the table and that there can be a prosperous Middle East. When that's going to come, I don't know, you don't know. But to me, that is the one way that American Jewry will prevail. I do not want a facile answer from you. I want a serious answer. Are you optimistic now about the future of American Jewry? Are you optimistic about peace in Israel? Two separate sides to the same kind of question. But Charles, uh, you know, we're on television, it's easy to be... Flip. Yeah, I'm asking uh, I, if you and I were talking off camera, right. if I were fortunate enough to have dinner with you somewhere and I said to you, Charles, are you optimistic? I'm asking you to be as honest as you can be in public. Are you optimistic about the American Jewish future? Are you optimistic about peace in the Middle East? I'm certainly optimistic about the American Jewish future. Because? because I think that Jews in this country, in this wonderful country, are free, totally and absolutely free. I believe there will be a Jewish president of this country, uh, hopefully in my lifetime and in yours. So yes, I am not concerned, frankly, about that because I think that the freedom that we not only enjoy but have built for ourselves will continue. As far as Israel is concerned, I only wish. I don't know what it's going to take. It's going to take, at the end of the day, two people of great courage to make that deal between the Palestinians and the Israelis. Now, there can be influences on both sides. Certainly, if MBS uh, keeps on going the way he is, uh, uh, and if uh, the Saudis and their allies um, lean on whoever is going to be the next uh, chair of the Palestinian Authority, because it's not going to be Abbas. 
And if the United States and the European allies lean on the Israelis, and I'm not talking about Netanyahu either, but if you have two leaders who are strong enough and determined enough to make for their peoples the kind of life that those people all desire, then we could have peace. Is it going to happen? I wish to heck I knew. I don't know you well. I've only watched you. What you've done for us is extraordinary. Kol Tuva Hatzlacha. You should only go from strength to strength in 120. And if there are any other opportunities, I get to sit and talk with you on L'chaim and JBS. I'd be honored to do so. Thank you, Thank Charles, you so very, much. very much. Thank you. You'll Great be to be with you. Thank you. Charles Bronfman here at the Jerusalem Post Conference.